Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the final session of this conference. Uh, the panel's title is Europe's Role in a Troubled World. Uh, this is the point at the, in the proceedings at which everything has been said, but not everybody has said it. <laughs> so you will hear some familiar subjects, but you will have the benefit of commentary on these subjects by an accomplished and distinguished panel. To my immediate left, Thomas Gomar, director of IFRI, the premier French think tank on foreign policy. Uh, next to him, Barbara Lippert, who has already been introduced. Uh, she has the distinction of being the only person out of the seven, million, seven billion people on the planet who is appearing twice as a panelist uh, in this conference. Uh, and uh, on, on the far left, not politically, but spatially, uh, Phil Gordon uh, of the Council. Uh, so we begin with uh, questions by me. And after half an hour, you will have an opportunity <laughs> to pose questions to the panelists. I want to pose a series of questions to all of the panelists. I, I, I would like each of them to respond. And the first one has to do with the now seldom discussed issue of European leadership in the world. The founders and the uh, perpetuators of the European project had as one of their goals, sometimes tacitly, sometimes explicitly, to form a union so that Europe as a whole could play a major role in the world. They wanted to increase not only Europe's <coughs> economic weight, but its geopolitical weight as well. Well, we find ourselves, and in a moment, as, as we uh, learned from previous panels, when the European project itself is beleaguered, to say the least. But my question for each of the panels is, does European global leadership have any meaning? Is this simply an oxymoron? It is, a, is it a dream that has definitively died? Or is there something to it? Does Europe still have the potential to exercise leadership, not just in Europe, uh, but beyond its borders? Why don't we go from uh, my left to my far left? Thomas, why don't you begin? I try to be optimistic, because you know all the discussion we had um, are quite pessimistic given the current situation in, um, in, in Europe. But um, if, we, if we try to see the things in terms of uh, historical evolution, I think we can be op optimistic and be very careful not to, to put away the European project as completely de de deadlocked. Um, I think that Europe can have a sort of global leadership on, on different uh, issues. Uh, two of them seems to me very, very important. The first one is uh, climate change which is something on which uh, Europe should be very active to implement the COP21 <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the continuation with the COP22. And the second one is certainly um, far away of our current concern, but seems to me highly important, especially in the transformation of the relation between the Europe and the US. I will be back on that, certainly. It is um, digital governance, on which certainly Europe has something particular to say regarding the US, regarding authoritarian uh, countries such as uh, China and Russia. That's, that would be my, my, my two ways to try to have a much more positive agenda. Now to, to respond to your question about the, the type of leadership we, we have at the time being in, in Europe. For sure they are very weak and if we compare with the founders, there is a, a huge gap between the political leaders, especially in my country, um, by comparison with, with, with the past. I think it's related to something deeper, which is also, uh, which can be seen also in, in the US, which is a type of selection of political leader we have. You know, <coughs> Henri Kissinger in, in his last book made a very interesting point in word order in, in last chapter to say, to some extent, to be elected at the time being, you should be a very good marketer. But as soon as you have a sort of political visions, you are not very interesting for, for, for the voters. And I think it's something visible not only uh, in Europe, but also in, in your country. Thank you. Barbara. 
um, just to underline the, the uh, Franco-German uh, cooperation, I broadly agree with what Thomas uh, um, has said. And uh, uh, I'm, I very much appreciate uh, um, that you reminded us uh, that uh, the creation of uh, the European uh, communities was not only a peace project, but also a power project to restore, in a way, uh, European influence uh, in the world. And uh, why does that not, uh, um, uh, why can't we translate that into some sort of, of leadership across the foreign policy agenda? Thomas pointed at some global governance issues where I think the uh, European Union was able to form even some sort of pioneering uh, uh, group and, and I think contributed to uh, uh, quite some good uh, uh, solutions. But um, when it comes to uh, uh, geopolitics, and we now see the return of, of geopolitics, um, uh, uh, the European Union uh, cannot deliver. And I think it also has something to do with some more structural constraints. So it's not only, I think, depending on uh, um, the personalities that are now uh, uh, leading uh, European member states. When you look at the, the uh, uh, structural constraints, <coughs> I always remember what I think uh, Stanley Hoffman said about the Europeans. It's a whirlpool of very different concerns and interests. And uh, that is uh, continuingly so and even growing. Uh, so we have, when you look at the reactions to the refugee crisis, which is the crisis, we talked at length about that, uh, uh, in the morning, you see that all these different experiences and also historical memories come up again and are either instrumentalized for uh, political reasons or they are a real sentiment and uh, make uh, uh, people um, prefer very often not to act collectively. And that is, I think, the point. These uh, uh, very different uh, concerns, differences among the member states, they grew with uh, enlargement, we now have only a small group that has, let's say, even some sort of geopolitical outlook. So most of the uh, member states inside the European Union, uh, they uh, care for uh, home and security, they care for their national uh, economies, uh, and basically that's it. They don't want to be bullied around, neither in the European Union, not of course uh, uh, beyond its borders, and that's why they join the NATO and uh, uh, the European Union, but they have no real experience <coughs> and interest to really face the external challenges. And here I think we have the link between what's going on at the domestic level, the many member states, and what's going on in, uh, in, uh, uh, at the EU level, and that is why I personally think that the very cautious approach now in writing an EU global strategy, which is the job of uh, Mogherini and uh, some others, is far more sober, is more realistic, is more restricted as far as the agenda uh, is concerned, and I think you will hear less uh, rhetoric and perhaps maybe a bit more action. Phil. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I will also give a modestly positive, at least not altogether negative answer to the question in the sense that you're right, Michael, as you pointed out, historically, the European project was not just about integrating Europe internally, but it was about developing Europe as a voice in the world and a true partner for the United States. Remember the Kennedy dumbbell theory and Europe would balance the United States. And after years of integration and common foreign security policy, you'd actually have a true unified partner. If that's your standard, then Europe obviously doesn't, doesn't meet it. A Europe that speaks without one voice and has something resembling a foreign minister and is a powerful actor in the world, not even on a par with the United States, but I I anything close, I think one would have to say, clearly, uh, it's not. I mean, you could go further and say, at the present moment, it's even worse than that, because to be an extroverted, important global actor, Europe has to be relatively united, relatively positive, feeling relatively rich and ready to do all of these things. And let's just say again, the present moment, you know, if you listen to all of the challenges Europe faces in previous panels, are actually more divided than usual over the question of the Eurozone, Greece, over the question of migrants, can't decide how to share them, 
uh, Russian pressure is, is raising divisions geographical. So it is hardly a propitious moment for that truly unified single European voice in the world. All of that said, and this is where I get to the modestly, modestly positive point, that was never a realistic standard. I don't think any, it was ever realistic that Europe would really come together to be a true United States of Europe partner with the United States. So if you accept that, then I would go back to some of the points Thomas made. It is still an important global actor. Relative to others, Europeans are still much more like-minded uh, and unified on big international questions, climate change. Iran, I mean, thinking about it from the point of view of a partner for the United States, and I suspect we'll get to that, uh, it's an important voice and one we couldn't do without. So uh, when you look at it from an American point of view, uh, as you're looking for partners around the world, as divided and weak and troubled as Europe is, uh, it's still probably the best single partner we have on the global stage. Thank you. Uh, I realized that I forgot to, uh, to read the uh, injunctions, uh, <laughs> which you've heard at the beginning of each session, so let me uh, read them now. Uh, Please turn off, not just put on vibrate your electronic gear, and uh, remember that this meeting is on the record. So don't say anything you wouldn't want to see in the New York Times. Um, the next question has to do with uh, European relations with, uh, well, the next two questions have to do with Europe's relations with and attitudes toward the two great or in one case, not quite so great, uh, extra-European powers, the United States and Russia. Let me ask first about the United States. In this country, Europe has become something like the lost continent. You don't hear much about it. You don't read much about it. There's not much sense that Europe's travails have much, if anything, to do with the United States. And uh, in an, uh, a previous panel, when the question was raised, what relevance does the United States have for the ongoing European crises? To my ears, we didn't get a robust answer of any kind. So uh, my question is, how do you assess relations between <coughs> Europe and the United States? How relevant and in what ways relevant, if at all, are these two longtime partners to each other. Let, let me start this time with Barbara, and then, then we'll go to Phil and then Toma. Okay. Uh, I think from a, from a European Union's perspective, of course, the US is still the most important, most relevant uh, partner. But uh, somehow uh, uh, this partnership has become more difficult uh, uh, over the years, and maybe some have already uh, lost some interest in investing in this partnership in making it again more more alive and uh, uh, I think there were some attempts for example when you think at uh, the initiative to come to the to the TTIP agreement that was uh, 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 sold as uh, uh, an economic NATO uh, for example so there is an attempt to find a new uh, sense of uh, of working together and having uh, uh, an agenda. Now with all the uh, troubles, and that's uh, uh, the title of our uh, panel, with all the trouble around uh, Europe, I think it's quite clear that we have a common agenda to be addressed. Although I think uh, it's uh, mostly the EU's uh, uh, foreign policy uh, responsibility which lies in its immediate neighborhood, even there when you think of the Middle East, the EU cannot do alone cannot make a significant uh, contribution but together with uh, the US and I think there is a lot of uh, 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 common ground you refer to the deal with uh, the agreement with Iran where the European Union and some of its member states played a leading role I think that could be also a blueprint for the future and we have just to see where are our let's say, specific strengths that we can invest into this kind of relationship. But then, of course, uh, in the first place, we have to have some sort of a common strategy. And I think uh, uh, here, 
I see more positive uh, signs under the pressure uh, of, uh, let's say, a neighborhood in flames. That's at least the perception from, uh, uh, from the continent. Phil. Uh, so a word on the state of the partnership and then a word on Europe from an American point of view. On the state of the partnership, I think it is fair to say that a certain degree of realism has set in, which is to say relations are certainly not hostile, but they're also not fulfilling maybe the hopes and dreams that some people might have expected as President Obama was elected following a deep, probably the deepest division in transatlantic relations in the post-war period over the Iraq War. And there's sort of that mutual, I mean, you could almost say disappointment on both sides. You're right, Michael, Americans aren't paying particular attention to Europe right now. It's not looming in the presidential debate. That's partly just a function of these Middle East crises are so overwhelming. Those are the real policy decisions in the places that we're devoting uh, blood and treasure. And then you know, Asia, the opportunity seen there is on the positive side, and Europe's not getting uh, a lot of attention. Uh, in the other direction, I do think there's a sense of, again, you could hear the word disappointment, which I, I would argue was maybe inevitable. There was so much hope placed on Barack Obama in Europe when he was elected again after administration that had such troubled relations with Europe. I had the uh, good fortune of being assistant secretary for Europe in that first year when just showing up was, you know, you were the most popular person in the room because you were representing this new administration and uh, Europeans pinned all of their hopes and expectations on President Obama and, and everything was going to be lovely. And then it turned out that uh, there were still differences. And I still remember, again, going back to this point about exaggerated expectations. Uh, one year in, in like 2009, I remember seeing a Reuters poll uh, where Obama, in his first year, was like at 85% popularity in Europe, then it went down to 81, and the headline was, Europe cools toward Obama. Um, the point being, I, we just never could have fulfilled the expectations that came in at the time, and so if there's a feeling of you know, relations are okay, but they're not great, I think it's because they're being held to an unrealistic standard. All of that said, again, taking it back from an American point of view, for whatever disappointments there are in the United States about Europe, going to back to this point about divisions and not playing a leading role, come back to my earlier point, it is still the place in the world with which we have the most in common, that has the most to contribute to these global crises that we seek to manage, these problems are hard enough as it is, you know, ISIS, the Iran deal, Syria, uh, Afghanistan, without the Europeans, for all their you know, weaknesses and lack of defense spending and division, all of that, it would be an even more, greater burden on uh, the United States. Thank you. Well, I think we've heard one cheerful note about the ongoing election, which is that whatever the outcome, it will not induce euphoria in uh, <laughs> Europe. So perhaps we can be grateful for that. Thoma. Yeah, I would like to respond to your question to, to, by starting to underline a paradox and to, to point out two tricky points. The paradox is um, related to the transatlantic relation and its real organization. And uh, speaking from France, it is something which is quite unknown by the public opinion, because in France, as you know, in, like in other European countries, it's very easy to mobilize politically a sort of anti-US feeling. But at the same time, uh, at the time being, the cooperation between uh, the P3 member, uh, Washington, London, and Paris, is uh, very, very narrow. And it is not very well known by the public opinion, uh, which is a problem in itself. But the point is that in terms of cooperation, intelligence sharing, military operation, nuclear things, there is a huge and very deep cooperation between these uh, two countries at the time being, which are certainly um, w which are uh, certainly sorry, very important for the transatlantic relations. Let me move to the two tricky points now. Um, for the transatlantic trade investment partnership, there is apparently a wish of the US administration to accelerate the negotiation and to try to end up the process by the end of uh, 2016. I think that politically it's something which is uh, um, uh, sensitive <coughs> you know, in, uh, in Europe. And I think it leads to the difficult combination we could uh, find between geoeconomics and geopolitics. That leads me to something which is also very um, uh, sensitive, which is sanctions policy, um, decided you know, by uh, Westerners, either by the US or Europeans. We spoke a lot about the sanctions against Russia, which can be seen as a positive move. 
we, we, sp we, we spoke less about the sanction about Iran, but we should think, having a European point of view, we should think about the cost of these sanctions for some European actors. It's, a, it's one thing to say that these sanctions were efficient, for instance, against Iran, but have a look on the consequences for some European banks, you know, in doing so. And I think that leads to something very difficult to deal with, which is, you know, the US extraterritoriality, which is seen more and more in Europe as something unacceptable. And certainly it is a point on which uh, Europeans and Americans should work very closely and to try to, to, to progress because it will feel the anti-US feeling. It will feel also the, the, the demonstration or the opposition to the TTT. Last point, digital governance. The same can be said. There is certainly a turning point with the Snowden affair, with the fundamental ambivalence of the US in terms of uh, digital activities. At the same time, to be presented as the, the country which supports uh, freedom of internet, liberty for connection, but using it to, uh, to increase its uh, dominating power on the European. So certainly on that, I think it's very important to try to progress and to work uh, together. Thank you. That brings us to Russia. And whatever else may be said about Mr. Putin, it's not possible to ignore him or his policies. And uh, Europe and the United States have not ignored him. Uh, what is the European view toward Russia? What are the prospects for continuing the current policy? Are there divisions within Europe? And since we'll start with Phil, how do you assess the state of transatlantic relations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia? Are there divisions between the United States and Europe on this subject? Uh, there are divisions between the United States and parts of Europe, which is part of the challenge, which is that Russia is not um, entirely uh, a question of consensus among the Europeans. It never has been since the end of the Cold War. You have had not surprising geographical differences on how much Russia matters and what policies towards Russia should be, with the, obviously the southern countries much more focused on the Mediterranean and North Africa and the Middle East and the countries that were either uh, you know, part of the Soviet space or Warsaw Pact, much more concerned about and, and desirous of of a different uh, Russia policy, and that uh, hasn't uh, gone away. Um, I think, and you know, obviously, the United States uh, at the start of the Obama administration uh, put a priority on Russia and the reset, and Europeans, I think, were fully on board for that. And it had the potential to be a matter of consensus for everyone, and I would argue that for a couple of years, it even worked. And while President Medvedev was in power, um, we made a lot of progress, both Americans and Europeans alike, in taking step towards trans steps towards transforming that relationship. And we got Russia on board for uh, sanctions on uh, Iran, and we signed a 123 nuclear agreement, and, and Russia agreed to allow uh, lethal uh, items to transit across uh, Afghanistan, and Russia ended up joining the WTO, and we had a common project towards a common policy towards Russia. Uh, as Putin came back to power, that policy ran its course, stalled, and, and then obviously collapsed with the developments in uh, Crimea and Ukraine, which brought us back to those uh, divisions. I think on balance, um, I think the transatlantic relationship and the European Union can survive those differences. And uh, while inevitably, geographically and historically, countries will have different attitudes towards Russia, this Russia with this Putin, with this degree of aggression, annexing Crimea and, and occupying parts of Ukraine, I think will be sufficient to maintain a relatively united European policy towards Russia, with a relatively united transatlantic policy supporting it, witness the uh, reassurance initiative and the additional American presence in Eastern Europe. Uh, it's obviously not going back to Cold War days when the Soviet threat was one of the factors behind the transatlantic relations, relationship and Europe, but I think it's enough to keep uh, the European allies together and the Americans and Europeans together. Thank you. Thomas. Okay. Three things on, on, on uh, Russia and the, the transatlantic debate on that. The first one is maybe to point out, you know, a collective failure uh, between Europeans and Americans because we, we are not successful in anchoring Russia uh, within the Euro-Atlantic institutions. 
Um, and it is uh, partly due, I think, to um, a, a lack of understanding of, of Russia, but also partly due to a sort of ideological approach uh, we could have in the past. Um, I like to remind that you know, when I started in this job 10, 10 years ago, uh, I fight against the idea of the do it strategy to go very quickly for the NATO enlargement, the so-called grids, the Middle East strategy, the Black Sea area, all this mapping which were so present you know, during the, the, the last decade. And uh, have a look you know, one decade after. Um, Putin's red line are much more serious than Obama's red line. It was absolutely clear that everything regarding Ukraine uh, would have been interpreted you know, in, in Russia as a, an aggression. So it was not taken seriously because I think that we didn't take seriously Russia during the, 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 the last decade. So now we have to deal with a resurgent Russia which, uh, with a country which is using nuclear intimidation and which is more and more assertive, which, uh, did, which do, does believe, sorry, that there is no real European leaders except Merkel. So if Merkel uh, failed to some extent, it will be a jackpot for, for, for Putin. And it's, uh, it's now a very serious um, a concern. Second point, there is a huge asymmetrical approach between <coughs> the US uh, and Russia, given the fact that for the US, Russia is a third rent issue, you know. But Putin is completely obsessed by the US. His main aim is, in fact, to re-establish a direct dialogue <laughs> with Washington. And it's partly down uh, thanks to the situation in, um, in Syria, from, uh, with, uh, with his, his point of view, obviously. Uh, for Europe, that's completely different. We cannot avoid Russia. Russia, even if there are some uh, evolution in terms of energy supplies, remains the first uh, export, uh, the first exporter for oil, gas, and coal for Europeans, and that's things that that cannot be changed, you know, in two or three years. That's something very, very uh, deeply, um, uh, very deeply rooted. And um, my final point is, in fact, also now the need we have collectively to think about Putin's Russia and uh, Putin's without Russia. It is pretty sure that in 2024. Uh, President Putin will become uh, prime minister. I mean, he is he's here to stay for uh, 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 until the, the end to some extent. But also, we should try to develop other channels and not be on our side completely obsessed by the Kremlin, but try also to understand, you know, the transformation <coughs> of the Russian society at the time being, which are very important. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, Russia uh, is the uh, neighbor of uh, the European Union. And the European Union made some progress in realizing that it is not the first and only uh, neighbor. And that is why, although it failed to some extent, the European Union developed bilateral and multilateral relations with all the countries in between, uh, like uh, the Ukraine, Moldova, and others. So uh, I think uh, one of the options had always been to follow a kind of Russia first mm. policy. And I think this time is definitely over as far as uh, the European Union uh, is concerned. And also Germany uh, had quite a change to the surprise of uh, Putin as far as its uh, policy uh, is concerned. So uh, the uh, concern of many uh, uh, of the uh, also uh, um, Central and Eastern European member states was that there is some condominium uh, between the EU and Russia as far as uh, uh, the countries in between uh, uh, are concerned. And I think there's always the temptation to have that kind of bargain because of course we need Russia for doing lots of other things, uh, not in the least when you, we talk about uh, Syria, uh, for example, and uh, coming to terms with the troubles in uh, the Middle East. So this kind of idea that you have some sort of a strategic concert <coughs> with, uh, with Russia is always uh, uh, coming up uh, again. But what we have now is quite a unified position of being tough uh, uh, when it comes uh, uh, to Russia and the sanctions are one uh, uh, example, and I think uh, there is uh, quite um, uh, 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 quite a good chance that uh, sanctions will be renewed. Although uh, Russia is putting pressure on many of the EU member states either to lift or at least to relax uh, uh, sanctions, um, but I think the the EU for the moment will be unified on this point. The other side of it is 
to support countries like the Ukraine, to strengthen the resilience there. And of course, the EU has some instruments, although they are also in the field of, of, uh, of aid, of, of uh, um, supporting the transformative uh, capacities uh, of these countries. But I think this is a very, very important point. So the other side of the medal. And of course, uh, there is the offer uh, that uh, 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 Russia comes out again of its, I would call it self-isolation in, uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, and there are uh, some sectors where cooperation is possible. So that it's the balance between being tough, deterrence, plus also opening channels uh, or keeping them open for dialogue. But that is, when you, when you look at the past 20 years or so, that is quite a change as far as the, the EU's position is concerned. Thank you. Uh, we'll come to questions from people other than the moderator in a moment. But I know from uh, previous conversations with the panelists that uh, they have subjects that they think are important to note that haven't come up yet. So let me uh, turn the floor over to them, first to Thomas, uh, to say uh, what you think or anything you think needs to be mentioned in this, at this conference and hasn't been thus far. I believe that the, the subject you think is worth uh, noting, at least briefly, is China. Yeah, it's, it's not only China, it's uh, the transformation of the relation between China, the US, and Russia, precisely, <laughs> because I think that this triangle has dramatic effects for the future you know, of uh, Europe. We are very, very focused at the time being uh, in Europe on the fragmentation of the Middle East for obvious reasons. But I think that we undermine you know, the transformation of the relation between Russia, China, uh, and the US, which are absolutely critical for the future of Europe and for the future of Japan, by, by the way. Why? For two main reasons. The first one is when you add uh, the US, China, and Russia, it represents uh, almost 40% of uh, mm -hmm. EU external trade, um, and uh, it's, um, it's also the three um, main military spendings in the, in the world, with the, uh, with the, IA, with the US first, uh, China second, and, and Russia uh, third. It is also three uh, countries having a strategic culture, having some global ambitions with different means, obviously. And um, it is also the, the main CEO emitters. So you can't avoid to think, you know, about these countries jointly, because to, 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 to some extent, they, they can decide much more things, you know, uh, for Europe that Europe can do for, for, for them, for, for sure. The second, the second point is also to think about the framing, the evolution of the so-called globalization. I think that the paradigm we had, you know, after the end of the Cold War um, is finished to some extent. And part of our question is to know now what sort of capitalism um, will we have? Uh, will we have a sort of capitalism related to democracy with all the limitations we can uh, underline? And we will have a capitalism related to authoritarian approach. And I think it's very important for Europeans in terms of positioning themselves because their company uh, will be obliged to, to position themselves and be able to tackle the US market, but also to tackle the Chinese or the Russian markets with all the kind of political consequences. And on that also, things are, are rather um, unclear. Last point, where is Europe, where is Western Europe, where is the EU on uh, Eurasia? Which is a, a very important question, you know, stated in the US to some extent. And on that, there are plenty of very difficult questions to, to respond at the time being, which is what will be the, 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 the European reaction to the so-called OBOR, One World, One Belt, promoted by, uh, by, by China. Some European countries seem to be very interested. I have to mention, for instance, uh, the agreement between Central European countries and China, which was not uh, mentioned during uh, this, um, this uh, day of conversation, plus the combination of the uh, absence of combination between OBOR and the Eurasian Union promoted <coughs> by Russia. That's basically a very uh, big and geopolitical question on which I think Europeans and Americans should uh, think together. Thank you. Barbara, on uh, structural issues in the EU. Well, I touched upon that already, so I just withdraw. Ah, well, there's, there's a very good citizen of this conference. <laughs> uh, Phil, on the Middle East. Well, uh, so I wouldn't say the Middle East hasn't been discussed here, but I would flag it as central to this question of what Europe's role uh, in the world 
is, um, and maybe this is a parochial perspective, but I mentioned you know, before doing the Middle East, the White House, I mentioned I was for four years Assistant Secretary for Europe. That was more than anything a job about Europe and the Middle East. Whenever the President or the Secretary of State met with a European counterpart, the agenda was uh, Iran, Israel and the Palestinians, Al-Qaeda, terrorism, Afghanistan. Uh, it's not that you didn't get to some European topics, but these were the issues on which we, more than anything else, had to work. And I would argue that today, they are even more central to Europe and to our potential partnership. Uh, obviously, you know, the terrorist attack in Belgium today, previously Paris elsewhere, these are issues stemming from the Middle East. The million plus refugees that are arriving in Europe and destabilizing the European Union in all of the ways we've been talking about all morning are derived from Europe. You have Libya collapsing uh, right across the Mediterranean from uh, European uh, member states. And you know, these issues aren't going to, to go away. They are going to remain central to Europe's very stability and the transatlantic partnership. And again, from an American point of view, notwithstanding, once again, all of Europe's weaknesses and divisions and lack of leadership and everything we can talk about, we can't deal with these issues without a European partner. I already mentioned Iran. Our sanctions had no effect until we got the European Union uh, oil embargo on Iran. Dealing with ISIS, uh, if you can't get control of borders and have counterterrorism cooperation, there's little the United States can do. So for all the flaws in the partnerships, differences in divisions, I think the Middle East is central to Europe's future and stability and remains central to our partnership. Thank you. Uh, now the time has come to invite members and their guests to join the conversation with their questions. Uh, remember that this is on the record. Uh, and I will repeat the instructions you have heard three times on the off chance that any of you has not committed them to memory. Wait for the microphone. Speak directly into it. Stand. State your name and affiliation. Please limit yourself to one question and keep it concise to allow as many people as possible to participate. So the floor is open for anyone who wishes to pose a question. Dr. Menon. How would the panel suggest that the next US president try to get Europe to bear a fairer share, share of the burden? of preserving the liberal international system from which Europeans have benefited as much, if not more, than the United States. And that, I mean that in two ways. One, there's the military, obviously, transatlantic burden sharing in NATO. But also, I mean, Tom, I raised the question of China. And it seems to me that Europeans have an absurdly self-interested and short-termist approach to China, which is let's sell them as much as possible and leave the Americans to deal with geo geopolitics in Asia. What can a new American president do to get more out of Europeans? Phil, why don't you begin, and then we'll, you, you can propose strategies. I have a feeling that this is not the first time this issue has crossed your plate. And then uh, our European participants will tell us whether any of the things that Phil proposes have any chance of working. Uh, indeed, Michael. I was going to say that that question has been asked in those very words every four years uh, since NATO was founded. And the United States has never felt Europe pulled its fair share of the burden. And every successive president has gone in with the view that they are going to find a different and better way to do this. And we've tried everything in its opposite, going back to the Mansfield Amendment and threats to pull out US forces from Europe if Europeans don't do more. Uh, and needless to say, none of them has been uh, entirely successful. Um, I don't know, and therefore, you, know, you won't be surprised to hear that I don't have a silver bullet uh, because you know, in the end, there's so many competing factors that explain why Europeans have never been enthusiastic about spending more for defense and doing more. I, I guess I could put it in a possible negative. I don't think that the threat to leave Europe on its own uh, is the answer. And that's often what Americans resort to. It's often what they threaten during a campaign. Indeed, we're hearing that a little bit in this campaign, uh, including yesterday with the remarks of one presidential candidate to the Washington Post saying, at times implying that NATO wasn't necessary, but other times implying it was necessary. We just got to get those deadbeats to do more. Uh, there's no guarantee that they will, and it's an experiment that you don't want to run. Uh, if you really do feel like there's a Russian threat to Ukraine or the Baltic states, 
but Europe should do more, you could try saying, well, we'll pull, we're pulling our Air Force out, you know, you guys are going to have to do more. But if you fail, then you've just invited a military conflict in Europe. And frankly, that, you know, if I were advising a presidential candidate, if I were, were a pre the incoming president, that's not a risk that I would want to run. So barring that sort of we'll pull out if you don't do more threat, you just have to do what we've tried to do in the past, which is have a serious, responsible public debate about the importance of these issues uh, and why we mutually have to work on them together. And you appeal to Europe's self-interest to play an important role in pursuing its own uh, interests. Let me uh, modify the question for our other two panelists. To Barbara, uh, I think it's fair to say, up to a point, that all post-war Western, uh, Western security policy was designed, among other things, to avoid the possibility or the necessity of a militarily powerful Germany. That was, throughout the Cold War, a precept of Western foreign policy. No German nuclear weapons, no large German army, no dominant German military power on the continent. And, and this was, of course, accepted, agreed to by the Germans. Uh, as a result, Germany, even more than other Western European countries, never really pulled its weight, leaving aside the question of how you define weight, in defense issues. So my question for Barbara is, is that era over? Should it be over? Well, gradually, uh, I think it's over. But of course, you, you characterize the, uh, the German uh, security culture, I think, uh, very correctly. Um, but uh, uh, Germany is not anymore, in principle, the non-interventionist uh, state. So Germany is, uh, I think, uh, prepared to engage with others. Uh, in the NATO framework or in the EU framework, although this is not uh, um, uh, on the cards. Um, uh, and uh, so I think uh, there is something, there is something uh, going on to take on more of a responsibility. And uh, I think uh, Constanze pointed out uh, before lunch that uh, uh, Germany is prepared also uh, uh, to uh, increase its uh, defense uh, budget. So I think uh, when Europeans now realize that there will be a constant threat from Russia, from its, uh, its immediate uh, neighborhood, I think a lot of things uh, 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 will change. Uh, and uh, um, you will see that also with spending more money uh, on uh, security uh, issues uh, inside the European <laughs> Union, when we start uh, being serious about, uh, for example, the deal with Turkey and what is expected from uh, frontline countries uh, with an external EU border, this uh, could lead to some sort of fortification uh, of uh, the European Union. Not that I'm entirely in favor uh, of that, but uh, that is one of the uh, directions we would not have thought of uh, um, five years ago. And just let me respond uh, um, to Phil Gordon. Uh, I think that, uh, that we have the Common and Foreign, Secu uh, foreign um, and Security Policy on paper since the Maastricht uh, Treaty in the early 90s was due to the perception, the anticipation of a gradual withdrawal of the US from uh, the Euro, uh, uh, from, from uh, the continent. And that is, we have to strengthen our own uh, uh, capacities. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that uh, is something which is now uh, even more uh, a pressing question for, uh, uh, for Europe. And you see with the Normandy format, for example, that although it is necessary to be in a, in a very close uh, communication and agreement with the US, but the leadership is with the, uh, with the European uh, uh, countries. And here you see, uh, not in the military sphere, but you see uh, changes, uh, developments on uh, their way, and I think that will continue. Thank you. Thomas, uh, the post-war strategic culture, by post-war I mean post-1945, uh, strategic culture in France, as in Great Britain, was the opposite of the one in Germany, for obvious reasons. 
uh, France did not practice military or political self-abnegation. The French thought of themselves as a military power and as a global power. And there hasn't been any great moment to change that attitude, and yet the perception, at least in the United States, I think, is that France, along with Britain, is withdrawing from the kinds of commitments and the kinds of aspirations in the strategic and security realm that it once uh, undertook and that formed the core of its foreign policy in the glorious days of General de Gaulle, as recorded by Phil Gordon in his book on the subject. So two questions. It is the perception that I have stated an accurate one, or is it a misinterpretation? And second, to the extent that it is accurate, to the extent that France is not doing as much as it used to do and used to aspire to do, why is that and can it change? <clears throat> well, your, your perception is uh, at the same time right and wrong. I, I will try to, to, to precise uh, the point. If, if, you, if you compare, you know, the, the military spending of France at the time being, it's uh, 32 um, billions uh, a, a year. If you compare with what it was in uh, 1991, uh, by comparison with the inflation and so on, it, it was at that time, you know, uh, 22 billion a year. So to some extent, as it was rightly said by our former uh, MFA, I mean, rightly, it's uh, is a point of irony. Um, we we use the dividends of peace. Uh, we, we 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 use the uh, dividend de la paix. So I don't know if it's possible to say in English. Peace dividend. Yeah. Peace dividends. You know, <laughs> very often to some extent. And now we are touching the point in which this situation is no more uh, manageable, given the fact that the French military is uh, completely overstretched by uh, its um, military intervention, namely in Africa. Plus the fact that the military, which is now a professional one, which is a big change by comparison with the end of the Cold War, is also asked you know, to patrol in, uh, in tons of friends after the terrorist attacks. So the situation is changing, given the fact also that I think that the next government will be obliged to put much more money in terms of military <coughs> spending. And there will be maybe a leverage effect. It, it will be the case also in Germany, as it was said, uh, before before lunch, when you observe the SDKR, you know from the UK, there are, there, there are also some uh, ambitions, military ambitions. So I think that the basic point is to say that Europeans will be obliged to put much more money uh, on their um, military <coughs> in the coming years. Uh, that's another question for so-called small countries, but I think that for for Germany, for France, and for uh, the UK, the direction is pretty um, is pretty clear. Uh, now the what does it mean for, for NATO and what does it mean in terms of uh, not only money but also uh, the, the will to intervene or to do things? I think that what was done you know, uh, uh, against Russia at the same time having you know, the EU acting through the Normandy, uh, the, uh, the, the Normandy formats plus the reassurance measure within NATO, it's, it was pretty well done. It is not well known in France that you know, France, which is very often portrayed as a pro-Russian uh, country, was very active you know, in reassurance measures in Baltic states. There are different things uh, at the time being in preparation you know, in terms of controlling the uh, novel aspects in which France, the UK, and other countries are very, very involved. So we, we, we can see a sort of uh, uh, a wish to, to share the, 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 the burden. The real issue is, in fact, what's, what sort of priority do we have? Do we think that Russia will become the main threat, which is basically the perception you know, in Eastern Europe for obvious reasons, or do you think that we, we should allocate much more military means towards the threat coming from the South? And on that, frankly speaking, the, the debate in France, for instance, is clearly for the second option. Thank you. Other questions? Well, in that case, I will use the chair's prerogative to put uh, another question uh, to our panelists. Um, clearly, one of the difficulties that Europe has is the shortage, or some might say absence, of effective governing mechanisms. And that's a chronic problem in international affairs. There's no 
world government. There's no European state. So it's hard to provide collective goods and coordinate. In the past, uh, I believe that it was true, or at least believed to be true, that the effective governing mechanism of Europe was the Franco-German partnership. Once the two of them decided on a course of action, they were able to bring the rest of the Union along. They were able to get the Union to do what it needed to do to supply for itself these so-called public goods. This was what made the European Union work. And that mechanism has collapsed. And collapsed in part, and here I'm giving a particular interpretation and I'll invite the panelists to agree, disagree, modify, or discard as desired, collapsed because uh, of French weakness and German strength. The ironic consequence of which has been to push Germany into the center of affairs, to put all of the burden of leadership in European affairs on Germany, uh, which the Germans, although now relatively more powerful than the French and more powerful than any other European country, are not in absolute terms hmm. powerful enough to carry out. So let me ask uh, each of you, uh, Thomas from the French perspective, uh, Barbara from the German perspective, and Phil from the American perspective, uh, is the problem or part of the problem in Europe the breakdown of the Franco-German partnership and to the extent that it is, can anything be done to revive it? That's a very serious and difficult issue. Let me start with the, it's, it's not a lieu commun, you know, for me to speak about the, the Franco-German uh, reconciliation because I was struck yesterday during the evening about the debate about the, the lack of seriousness of the reconciliation between Poland and Germany. But just to give you an example about the transformation of our respective society. Uh, last Saturday, I celebrated the birthday of my kid, which is uh, nine years old. We had 12 kids at home. It was a nightmare anyway. But four of them were um, at the same time um, uh, speaker fluently in German and in French. You know, it's not a, it's not a special school, but uh, a French school has um, many others. And it seems very natural, you know. It, it's, it's like uh, something which is now quite common to some extent. So I, I pointed that just to say that the reconciliation is at the same time something very, very substantive. But I think that the next generation, that things are very natural, you know, to work closely between uh, uh, France and Germany at the level of uh, civilian societies. That will be my second point of answer. <coughs> I think we have a disconnect uh, between France and, and, and Germany because of uh, the situation within the, the political um, class, especially for the French one, which didn't understand or which didn't want to understand the asymmetrical position between Germany and France because of the lack of structural reforms uh, in, in France. And I think that Germans, for sometimes uh, understandable and sometimes non-understandable <coughs> reasons, are to some extent fed up with this lack of seriousness uh, in France, especially coming from the French political elites. Because it is very often seen, you know, as okay, uh, Germany will continue, you know, to, 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 to support us. And I think we are approaching a point in which there is a, a real question of trust about the ability of, of, of France, and that will be the, the main challenge for the next uh, president, uh, just to deliver at, at his, uh, as it is uh, expected. S final point, I think also we should be careful not to, to think that everything can be discussed between Paris and, and Berlin, and after that, you know, implemented by others. This period is completely over because um, other, other European countries can be fed up, you know, with Germany, as if it was expressed <laughs> quite, quite strongly yesterday during the, the, the dinner, but they are also sometimes very fed up with this idea of the couple between France, France and Germany. So a lot should be done to explain and to, to, to say that it's a very important, essential to have close relations be, between um, uh, Paris and, and Berlin, but it's not sufficient. Barb. So uh, I agree with the analysis, but uh, even if we were able to sort of uh, reignite this uh, franco german engine uh, for the sake of uh, better European uh, integration, I think it will not be enough. So uh, you pointed at uh, uh, 
the interests uh, uh, of other uh, member states. And in the past, of course, the two countries, France and Germany, they succeeded in forging some compromises, although their initial positions did not converge. And that was the, the beauty <laughs> about uh, the whole thing. But uh, they sorted out uh, uh, some common ground. And they then defined a corridor. And, and all the other member states could meet in that corridor. Uh, and now it's more a kind of a labyrinth or something far more puzzling than having this quite clear uh, corridor. Uh, and uh, um, I have to say, uh, when we look around, what are the other uh, uh, member states that are prepared to invest in such a common endeavor to forge compromises? And many of us hoped uh, 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 that Poland would be uh, the country, which is not, uh, uh, I think, taking up this kind of, of uh, responsibility. The UK is um, even more on its way out. Uh, it's uh, what you can call maybe a semi-detached uh, um, member. Maybe it becomes a, a, a semi-attached non-member uh, in the future. So it does also not invest uh, in this. And I think that would be absolutely uh, necessary to cope with all uh, uh, these uh, uh, challenges. And um, I think uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Normandy format, if it is successful and if it's regarded as a common success with some, let's say, uh, also uh, uh, feedback kind of communication with the whole of the uh, 28 and the European Council that could uh, 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 be um, a way to, to have, again, a more, let's say, successful uh, leadership of the European Union that can really deliver on the problem. Thank you. Uh, I suspect that the UK will end up being a, a corresponding member of the club <laughs> okay. or an out-of-town member. And when you're an out-of-town member of the club, you pay less dues. <laughs> uh, Phil, you have the last word on this question, the last word on the panel, and therefore the last word of the conference. <laughs> and with that build up, the floor is yours. That's an enormous responsibility. <laughs> well, I hope I don't let people down. Um, but I will make a comment about what, what you rightly raise is a really important point. The, the Franco-German motor no longer exists, and I think your narrative is right. But I would stress, I think, that that genie can't be put back in the bottle to mix metaphors, if, if you will, which is to say, you're right. At the time, that was the driving motor, and Europe could always count on it. But of course, at the time, you had a much smaller European Union, and those two <laughs> countries really were the bulk, economically, militarily. They could call the shots, which is just long gone now in a Europe uh, that is so much bigger. I think you had a generational commitment to European integration that doesn't exist today to the same degree. Uh, it is taken for granted, and the whole post-war belief that only with France, Germany, and Europeans coming together could you have peace uh, isn't felt as strongly. I think back in the day, each of those countries had a reason to prioritize Europe and each other over other things. France wanted to bind Germany, given historical lessons, so was willing to do whatever it took to keep that partnership together. And Germany, in a way, wanted to be bound and prioritized uh, European uh, integration. And so on top of all of that, you have these big challenges that we've been all been talking about, which divides Europe further. Eurozone and Greece, uh, the migrant crisis, different attitudes towards uh, Russia. So we can be nostalgic about the Franco-German partnership and that motor not existing. But I don't think that that's the fix to this current set of problems. And frankly, even numbers and size alone raises an almost insurmountable problem for governance. I mean, that could be a whole other seminar, and we won't do it in the last 20 seconds here. But how do you manage a union? It seems to me, and this is really for the Europeans to talk about, but European leaders spend so much of their time going to EU summits. And it was one thing when at, was it Fontainebleau, you know, Cole and Mitterrand could do a pull aside and just decide what they were going to do or give Thatcher money back, you know, with two or three people. You can't do that. Guess what? Poles have views, and Spaniards have views, and Latvians have views, and they have vetoes as well. Uh, so that raises just much more fundamental problems of European governance that you know, I don't think the fix, I don't think we can go back to that uh, old Europe, but I don't know this, what we can go to raises all of the questions that were discussed in the 
previous panel about more or less. The an one, one obvious answer is more. You have to take a fundamental jump to federalism, uh, but it doesn't appear that European publics are ready to do that. Thank you. It's always good to end a conference on a fundamental uh, unsolved problem <laughs> because that paves the way for future conferences. <laughs> Uh, let, we have come to the end of our time, so let me thank the panel for their insights. And thank all of you for coming, and most importantly, thank Rita Hauser for making this possible. We are adjourned. Thank you, Michael.